Des Moines, and all of Central Iowa, welcome to Max World Live. Max World is your world. Every day we talk about the issues and topics that matter most to you. And as always, it's your voice we want to hear in Max World. So join the conversation by calling 515-244-0077. And now, here's the host of Max World Live, J. Michael McCoy. Seven minutes after three o'clock on the 30th day of the month of March. One more day left, and it's officially second quarter 2016. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and you're listening to Max World Live, a radio program heard every day, Monday through Friday, right here on The Truth, 99.3. Some people would tell you this is a Christian preaching and teaching station. That's what the category would be in in the broadcast lingo. Some people would tell you that this is a uh, conservative talk radio show that has a biblical worldview. That's what I say. Now, what is that difference? Well, it means that we talk about things other than theology. We talk about your life. We talk about the water cooler talk. We talk about the things that are important to you and your family. And at the bottom of the rung, at one degree away from you or me, are the ankles of Jesus nailed to the cross. And that's where we all meet and get along. And understand and know the difference between right and wrong and where we find that difference. That's 99.3 The Truth, at least from 3 to 5 every afternoon. The rest of the station, I think, is awesome. I can't believe how much I learned from it. It is a definite part of my journey, and I know it was God's will for me to be here every day with you from three to five in the afternoon that's uh what'd you call it provincial providence providence providential Pro- provident providence it, it's providential providential yep which is providence it is by god's grace and his providence that you were here mac yeah. is it prophetic i'm just trying to try p words <laughs> that's a fun one you can okay. you know god i don't know that he yeah no well let's not go with prophetic Bob uh, Monser at the Cat in the Hat watching the chat. You can text in questions or comments to the Service Legends uh, talk and text line at 515-809-0993. Luke Tim from Living Faith uh, Lutheran is here along with Chris Roloff from KTIA. And today we're being produced by Jeb. Uh, I want to invite and welcome our guest for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, You may have heard of him. Uh, I'm absolutely surprised that I never had. I have to be honest with you. When the name first came to me, um, I said, I'm sorry, I don't know who that is. His name is Stanley Hauerwas. Stanley, did I say that right? Stanley, did I say your name right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you certainly did. Stanley Hauerwas. Right. All right, and Stanley is a, uh, uh, in 1970, he joined the faculty of Notre Dame University. In 1983, he moved to Duke Divinity School, and earlier this year, he published a memoir, Hannah's Child, a theologian, a theologian's memoirs. Uh, he is called by some a professor's professor. Uh, I'm just getting to know you, Stanley, so welcome to Max World here on 99.3. Thank you for being with us today. I'm happy to be there. So what are you passionate about, Stanley? Let's start with what's important to you. I'm passionate about reclaiming the church's integrity after it has become so accommodated to the American culture. Reclaiming the church's identity? Integrity. Integrity. Right. And, all right, because we have uh, fallen back into culture. Well, uh... America was the great um, experimental project of Protestantism. It was the first place that Christians as Protestants had to make a way that wasn't already determined by Catholic culture. And we did. And now we have trouble 
distinguishing what it means to be an American from what it means to be a Christian. Do you think we have failed what the founding fathers set out to build and declare? No, I think that we've been very faithful to the founding fathers, and that's just the problem. Uh, people forget that the founding, the founding fathers were largely deists who had a very uh, accidental relationship to classical Christianity. So America was never a quote-unquote Christian nation? Uh, no. Uh, we certainly had that pretension, but uh, America uh, was a country that, um, and, and of course it was very different in different geographical areas, but uh, it was fundamentally a country that um, uh, was founded on an idea of God rather than the living God of Christ. All right, Stanley Hauerwas is our guest. He is a, a theologian and a, a divinity professor at Duke University. So um, where did we go wrong? I mean, you, you, you said that we're not, or we are following what the founding fathers wanted, but yet it's gone terribly wrong. So how did it go wrong? It went wrong just to the extent that the church found it very hard to maintain the kind of discipline, disciplinary uh, um, behaviors necessary to mean a faithful people uh, in a world that knows not the God we worship. And that was um, more or less in the script from the very beginning. Okay, so it, help me a little bit. Talk to me like I'm a six-year-old. What did we flee from in Europe that we created here? Well, we, we thought what we fled was, um, uh, was the um, um, attempt by what was then, what became Roman Catholicism to suppress Protestantism. So allegedly, what we wanted was freedom of the church, the, the but, Catholic Church. Uh, um, we wanted freedom from the Catholic Church, the yeah. Protestants. Did. But uh, wh what we people forget that when um, uh, the Puritans came to New England, um, they uh, didn't give freedom to the Catholics. <laughs> so the. Um, uh, the very idea of freedom of religion meant freedom for our religion, not yours. And mm. uh, that uh, became an accommodationist strategy, which we still suffer from. Stanley Hauerwas is our guest. He is the prof I want to get your, your name correct. Are you, are you the professor of divinity at Duke University? Uh, I... Uh, my appointment is, uh, I'm now emeritus, the Gilbert T. Rowe Professor of Theological Ethics um, in the Divinity School. At oh, man. I, I like the short time better, but we'll, we'll get that down. <laughs> you, can use, you can use anything you want. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me ask you, and I'm going to be embarrassed, of course, if, if, if this isn't the case, but have you ever read or heard of someone by the name of Erwin Raphael McManus? The name is vaguely familiar, but I can't place it. Okay, well, he, he, one of my favorite books, and it's probably one of my favorites because it's very short. It's about two and a half hour read. is called The Barbarian Way. And I want to read something from this and, and, and then have you tell me whether you would concur with this. And I'm not telling you this is right. I'm not trying to figure out right from wrong. I just know that when a bunch of my guys in my Bible study at church started reading this book, we got to this two paragraphs here and we went, oh, that's what we need to be. And I think you fall in the same camp. But he, let me read this for you. Would that be OK? Certainly. Christianity has become our Shawshank, and our redemption will only come if we find the courage to escape the prison we have created for ourselves. Risking everything to live free is our only hope, humanity's only hope. Jesus is being lost in a religion bearing his name. People are being lost because they can't reconcile Jesus' association with Christianity. Christianity has become docile, domesticated, and civilized. 
We have forgotten that there is a kingdom of darkness stealing the hopes and dreams and souls of our children and a humanity without God. It is time to hear the barbarian call to form a barbarian tribe and to unleash the barbarian result. Let the invasion begin. (laughs) Yeah, he writes wonderfully. I I could I think I agreed with everything that was there. Okay, because that that helps me put my arms around you a little bit better to understand uh, where you're coming from, because, you know, in this day and age of Google, uh, I can read just about anything that people want me to know about you. But in the few minutes that we spoke the other day, and so far the minutes we've spoken here, it and take this as a compliment, you're a much simpler, humbler man than a lot of the Google would try to make me believe. Uh, well, I hope that's the case. I was um, I was raised a bricklayer, and uh, bricklayers have rather direct speech. Some of it rather colorful, which I try not to use so much anymore. <laughs> and uh, and I've always wanted to be able to write for the church, not just other theologians. Yeah, it's been one of the. Um, one of the crises of modern theology that is done primarily in universities in which academics write to other academics. And, of course, theology is an office of the church that um, should be uh, available to any Christian. All right, Stanley, I appreciate that. We're going to take a three-minute break. When we come back, Pastor Luke Tim, who is a big fan of your book, Resident Aliens, uh, would like to ask you a couple questions. I certainly thank you for being a part of Max World today live on 99.3. My name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Hey, everybody. I brought Northern Lights pizza. And it's got Graziano sausage. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.
21 minutes after 3 o'clock, 321, 30th day of March in the Lord's year 2016. Coming up next hour, we have lost a 16-year-old young man in our community to suicide. And his funeral is coming up Friday. I want to talk about that a little bit and what we're talking to and what we're saying to our kids and our grandkids about what seems to be somewhat of a increasingly popular trend. And that is, unfortunately, when one young man or young woman decides to take their own life, there are usually one or two who come later. We've seen that in the Southeast Polk District. We've seen that in the West Des Moines District. And we have certainly seen that in the Johnston District. We're going to talk about this and we're going to pray about it. That's next hour here on The Truth. My special guest today is Stanley House uh, Hauerwas. Stanley is uh, a real big dude at Duke University. And he's a the- theologian uh, who who likes ethics? Did I am I in anywhere close there, Stanley? I don't like it. I do it. <laughs> All right, good. Um, and I've got a couple questions about culture and society for you, but I think I told you when I called you the other day that I have a friend of mine who co-hosts this show with me every once in a while, and he really uh, has learned a lot, has grown a lot, not only as a man but as a husband and as a father and pastor, become because of some of your writings. And so I want to introduce you to my good friend Luke Tim Stanley, uh, Professor Howarwas. I before we even talk i I just have to tell you that um the book resident aliens was a game changer in my ministry um i graduated from st louis seminary and felt as though i had walked out of an institution with uh wrenches and and hammers and screwdrivers all of these tools and no clue what to do and so when i read resident aliens um suddenly things began to make sense uh as far as the the church and culture and at, I finally understood what the ob- objective was because of your book. And it has shaped, you know, my the current church and the church I've served at before. And uh, you have done a lot for me and for my ministry and for countless people throughout the Midwest who've, who've uh, heard a different kind of pastor because of your work. So I just want to say thank you. Well, I'm, I'm gratified. Um, I have received um, numerous testimonies like yours. And all you can say is, God is great. Amen, I mean, brother. Will and I, of course, didn't know we were doing that when we did it, but that God has made more of it than we could have anticipated, and I'm deeply grateful. Yeah. What denomination is St. Louis Seminary? Uh, we are Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Oh, you're in Concordia. Yep, that's correct. I see, I see. Well, that's great. Uh, so are you still in Missouri? I sure am. Oh, uh, that's terrific. You know, I... I have old friends who were Missouri but are now Roman Catholic. Uh, um, Richard Newhouse, uh, of course, who's now deceased, and Robert Wilkin, they all came to Concordia. And uh, that extraordinary formation that Missouri gave um, there at uh, the seminary, it's really uh, quite uh, quite something. Yeah, I have to tell you, you have far better friends than I do. <laughs> hey, hey, I resemble that remark. <laughs> Let me ask you, um, you just mentioned earlier about the shift, um, the American shift towards, the, the way I've spoken of it is, um, our church culture has shifted from um, a church culture of patriots who love Jesus towards something in, in fundamentalists and uh, the evangelical movement towards nationalism. Yeah. That shift. I think it's been there for a long time. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And what I'd love to know is, is do you see, and, and, and could you expound on um, the what is common between that shift of the American church towards nationalism with Rome's shift towards um, its empire. I, I think that those two things are similar, but I'd love to hear are the, the common elements between the two. Well, America, of course, is empire. Um, one of the ways to think about it is that we believe we were founded on the pursuit of happiness, liberty, so on, which is, we believe, what anyone would want if they had our money and our educational uh, formations. So 
when America goes to the world, we assume when we say, we know you want to be democratic and we're going to make you that, that we're speaking for anyone, what anyone would want. And that's an imperialist viewpoint. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's a way of not respecting the particularities of the kind of formations that other cultures have to go through. And, of course, we identify that with Christianity because we assume that the, that the political form that Christianity must take is some kind of democracy. So when we're asking you to be democratic, we're also asking you to be Christian. Understood. And do you see um, democracy and Christianity as antithetical, or, or can the two coexist? Well, my way of putting it is, I mean, it depends on what you mean by democracy, obviously. But my way of putting it is, is that modernity names the time that you wanted to produce people who believed they had no story except the story they chose when they had no story. That was called freedom. You create people who believe they should have no story except the story they chose when they had no story. And if you don't believe that's the story that fundamentally shapes the American ethos, I, I can illustrate it this way. Do you think you ought to be held responsible for decisions you made when you did not know what you were doing? That's the institutional form of you should have no story. Right. And, of course, most people think they should not be held responsible for decisions they made when they did not know what they were doing. And then I point out the only problem with that is it makes marriage unintelligible. Because how would you ever know what you were doing when you promised lifelong monogamous fidelity? That's the reason why the church wants you to have your marriage witnessed in the congregation, because we're going to hold you to promises you made when you didn't know what you were doing. Right. And, it, and if you think it makes marriage unintelligible, try having children. You never get the ones you want. Right. Uh, what's, what's so antithetical, of course, to that story is we Christians do not believe that we should have no story except the story we chose when we had no story, because we're storied before we choose. We are creatures of a gracious God. So the very fact that what it means to be a Christian is to learn to live into the story of which we've been given by God and called grace makes it possible for us to be quite a different people than a people who believe that freedom is their first way of life, understood as having no story except the story they chose when they had no story. And that, that determinative nature of democracy tells us over and over again that we are the ones who choose and decide and, and create reality for ourselves and direct our own path. And that seems to me as though it's uh, counter to the gospel that claims us. I'm afraid that's exactly true. And that, I mean, freedom for Christians is perfect obedience. It is uh, when we live lives of discipleship to the one alone who has the right to claim us totally. Yeah, one of the things I love most about your book is um, how it talks about our freedoms becoming that which enslaves us, and the, the freedom that our country gives to us turns into our master. Yeah. I mean, people think, I mean, one of the ways to think about it is is that pe people have a solution to, to uh, the problem that marriage presents. It's called divorce and remarriage, and they do that several times. There's also a, a response to the problem that you didn't get to choose your children. It's called abortion. So it, it, the kind of culture that we live in maritally, and of course we're not, we're not a culture of monogamy, we're a culture of serial polygamy. And that kind of culture and the kind of culture that we, um, uh, that supports abortion as a way of life are, reflect, I think, the deep antithesis between what it should mean to be a Christian and the kind of culture in which we find ourselves. Our special guest today in Max World on the Truth 99.3 is Stanley Hauerwas. Stanley is the, and this is going to be my term, not his. He's got an official title that's much better than the one I'm about to say, but he's in charge 
of all the professors of theology <laughs> and divinity at one of the top theological schools in the country, and that's Duke University in uh, North Carolina, right? That's right, Durham, North Carolina, but you just made me a dean, and I'm certainly not that. Okay, so you're not the dean, but uh, in in an article that I read about you, in which you participated in from Christianity Today, they did say that you were the professor's professor. I guess that's right. That, that's their description. Yeah, not yours. I know. I appreciate that. All right, so let me ask you this question. I want to get down to kind of 2016 on the ground. Given that you're passionate about reclaiming the church is integrity uh, because it's fallen back into the culture, where did we go wrong? I mean, was it was it giving women the vote? Was it freeing slaves? Was it allowing divorce to become acceptable, remarriage and divorce acceptable in the church in 60s and 70s? Was it the LGBT movement? Or do I need to go back hundreds of years before I can even remember? It was the Christian enthusiastic participation in war. Mm. When Christians lost any sense that we had a problem with war. We lost the necessary uh, tension that the church always has with the world. So do, do we go back to the Crusades? Um, well, the Crusades were not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Famous but, quote. I'll, I'll, I'll write that one down, Stanley. Right, Thank you. Right. <laughs> but um, I think that... Um, in, in America, uh, World War I was a decisive event because it was the first time that you reintegrated the South into the Union. I mean, we Southerners are, are just natural-born killers, and we were frustrated that we weren't getting to kill anyone. So we even went to fight for a Yankee war. And uh, that's when the American flag reentered the chancels of the churches in America, and uh, they're still there. And it is a powerful symbol of, of the kind of sacrifices that were made by people in war, which has to be respected. But at the same time, I mean, people forget most Christians go to war not because they are conscientious participants, because they didn't know there was any alternative to being not a participant in war. But they went as enthusiastic participants because they didn't know there was an alternative. Stanley, did, do we have or did we have the constitutional right to say, because of my faith, I will not go to war? It doesn't matter whether you had the constitutional right or not. That's what Christians should have said. If you go to jail, you go to jail. That's not a new thing for Christians. I mean, Paul, Paul certainly uh, experienced it. Uh, our guest today is Stanley Howard Wass. Uh, Stanley is a professor of divinity at Duke's uh, uh, Evangelical uh, Theological Divinity School. I'm sorry, I'm not the best at We're this. We're actually Methodist. You're actually Methodist. Good. My grandmother loves you. Well, well, we, I mean, we are an ecumenical divinity school, but uh, our uh, history is deeply uh, involved with the Methodist Church. All right. We're coming back with Stanley. One more break, Stanley, then we'll have you for 10 minutes, and then we'll let you on to your next class. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for joining us live on 99.3. Northern Lights Pizza's amazing garlic butter makes amazing breadsticks. Now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, High Bee, and Graziano's. Northern Lights Pizza. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do 
is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile. That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. 3.38, uh, 22 minutes before the top of the hour. <laughs> I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is our live program, Max World, every afternoon. I have a, a, a great guy on the phone, uh, Stanley Hauerwas. He is uh, the head of, uh, he's one of the top professors at the Theological, Theologian, uh, Evangelical Divinity School of Ethics at Duke. Close? That was a lot of words, Mac. That was, was, a, that was a lot of words. I, um, I, I should mention, by the way, I taught two years at Augustana College in Rock Island. Oh, yeah. So I'm fairly familiar with the area. Yeah, we uh, we love it here in Iowa. This is a a great place to live. Now we're a little tired after the caucuses, of course. Uh, we've had presidential candidates at our feet for two years almost. Here's what I think is interesting, Stanley. I'm I'm blessed enough to have people from all walks of light listen to this show, and one of my favorite people who is just a downright great heathen. His name is Gil, and he's been a friend of mine for a long time. He put on Facebook, uh, "Call me after the show." This guy is just nuts. And that's a great compliment for you, coming from a heathen like Gil. So um, uh, that's probably the best compliment you'll get today so far. Well, I, 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 I would like to think that I, I try to give atheists something worth disbelieving in. <laughs> there you go. I like that. Uh, un unfortunately, um, we just can't produce many interesting atheists in our day because we're not that interesting as Christians. So we give atheists less and less into which to disbelieve, and uh, I'm trying to um, reverse that. Yeah, we certainly uh, have given atheists a lot to kind of point out and call us out in the darkness. You know, we just... Uh haven't done really well. Luke Tim is here, uh, uh, the pastor of Living Faith Lutheran Church, and uh, he said that he's got uh, several of your books, God, Medicine, and Suffering, and then your autobiography, Hannah's Child, and then his uh, favorite book, Resident Alien. And you, you had a question for him 
about the God medicine and suffering, Luke. I do. Actually, uh, Professor Hauerwas, what I'd love to do is ask you the question that I get because I implement this stuff from your book, and I'd love to hear you answer it <laughs> so that I will have a better answer. <laughs> and that is, um, oftentimes when I, when I describe what I think is um, a very similar relationship that, that you hold to of the church and the state um, of, this, of this colony that we are that exists as a resident alien inside of this experiment called America is that oftentimes people, um, and I don't mean like, I don't have people accusing me in, an, in a mean way, but what they ask is, isn't that fatalistic? Um, if, if indeed, when you read the book of Revelation, at the end, over and over again, the saints appear to have lost and, and lose their lives and, and then receive glory in heaven, aren't we then fatalist? Shouldn't we do something? How, how do we... How are we to be a resident alien, um, object to things of the country, remain patriots, and not be fatalists? Well, fatalism is, of course, the uh, position of Stoicism, in which um, Roman um, of the higher classes thought that they were fated to have to uh, be in uh, a be people that were loyal to the Roman Empire as the kind of bureaucrats that keep such an empire going. Christians thought they were not fated because they were given a a, a calling by God to not be citizens of such an empire. And I think the same kind of contrast works in America exactly what it means to be a Christian is not to be fated to assume that the way things are is the way things have to be, given the American um, reality. It sounds as though, um, the way you answer that, there seems to be the more hope in this idea of a Christian colony than there does in this um, mechanized machine that we call America. Well, I certainly think that's the case, and um, I mean, I I think that hope is a very scarce commodity among the American people. Amen to that. Uh, what do you hope in? Right. Do you, do you, do you, I mean, people say, well, we have hope for future generations. Well, you know, we are people that believe in original sin. I mean, uh, do you think your children really are going to make the world that much better? They're your children. Why should you think that? Right. Um, uh, I think that we as Christians have hope that God has never abandoned us and that we are being given always opportunities by God that defy the fatalism of the world. Right. If... Um if we have an answer, if the, if the church on earth, this colony, has an answer, um, sometimes I have this fear that the culture won't even understand it because the, the translation of our answer into the culture is such a different language. And, and what I mean, I think when you were talking before about divorce or abortion, those things are answers um, to a perceived problem. And our response, our answer... It lies in redemption, and that's a, a theological concept that those void of the Spirit or, or void of that context sometimes don't understand. Is it possible that we—how do we answer that? How do we solve that problem? I think, I think the way we answer it is to say, we're offering you the possibility of friendship with— a body of people across time and space, which means you don't have to go it alone. That part of what the church is about is to be called into a body of people who are present to one another in tragedy and in joy in a manner that helps us see it's not all up to us. It's up to our ability to pray for one another that constitutes us into a body that otherwise the world cannot know. 
Okay, if you were to if you were to give precedent to one of these two, and I know this is not fair of me to to ask you, but the community over and above the proclamation of the truth, which is more significant uh, in somebody's life, especially a new Christian community the of proclamation believers? Proclamation of the truth, which mm. entails that we are the Church of Jesus Christ, through which the world knows what is true. Which leads us to that community, which is what you were saying before, so integral to having hope. Yes, no, I think it's just absolutely crucial. And uh, that, um, I mean, Americans are optimistic, but we're not hopeful. <laughs> right. There's a big difference. Stanley, we've got about a, a minute left here. So what advice do you have for my audience on how we can begin to, to make a U-turn with this Queen Mary called Christianity Against the Culture? Uh, never lie. Never lie. Yeah. Okay. It's not easy, but never lie. And, uh, and you will discover how much you need one another to tell one another the truth. Mm. And that that's, uh, that's certainly got to be part of what it means to be a Christian. Is that because it is believed in many uh, religious circles that every sin begins with a lie? Um, that's not a bad way to put it. <laughs> I like that very much. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, my wife doesn't treat me well enough, and therefore I have the right to go out and, and be with another woman, and, and I deserve that. Um, I, I, I can't deal with work because my boss is such a jerk, so I'm going to drink when I get home. Um, I, I'm going to be a gambler because I don't get to take any risk at home. The wife's in charge at the boss. He's in charge, so I'm going to go to the casino, and I'm going to gamble. And the sin is it's a lie. Yeah, the problem with those examples is they're uh, they're not complex enough. <laughs> We're much more complex sinners than those examples suggest. I think. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to I want to uh, uh, I want to honor the time that you had for us today, and our time is about up. Uh, perhaps you'll uh, put it into some prayer and give us an opportunity and come on the show again, sir. Uh, fine. It's, it's uh, lovely talking with you. Thank you very much. Stanley Hauerwas, our guest today, uh, will come back right after this live here in Max World. You take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. Northern Lights Pizza, your home of the tasty crust. Our garlic butter sauce now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, Hy-Vee, and Graziano. Northern Lights Pizza. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common, everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. 
3.50, 10 minutes before the top of the hour, top of the hour, Salem Radio Network News. And uh, then our second hour, a couple of things we're going to talk about in our second hour. Um, we had a suicide Easter morning of a 16-year-old Waukee kid, young man. Um, uh, and I, I just want to talk about this a little bit. I want to I want to make sure that I'm saying the right things to my grandkids who are right in this area. What do you say to your kids? What do you say to your grandkids? Have you ever been through this before where a, a, a friend of one of your kids or grandkids has committed suicide? I need some input. I need some wisdom. I need some I need some strength here. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, next hour, we may carry over this conversation uh, that we've had with Stanley Hauerwas. Uh When I booked this guy, it was because uh, I thought Chris Roloff was a big fan of his. And in fact, uh, uh, that wasn't the case. But in the middle of a Bible study uh, that I attend Wednesday at noon over at Living Faith Lutheran Church, I happened to mention to the pastor, hey, I've got this guy on. And I even mispronounced his name, right? Yeah, a couple of times. Yeah. And- <laughs> I admit it, I misplaced <laughs> it. And so this guy uh, wrote, if I get it right, he wrote a book called Resident Aliens, which kind of made your ministry what it is today, or a part of it at least. You, in a lot of ways, um, it allowed me to start asking the right questions. I mean, this this book does not have every answer in it. I, I mean, it just isn't that. But what it is, is, is suddenly this uh, assessment of why the church exists and and what it's supposed to do and so it, just asking the right question gets you towards better answers so i felt like um for the longest time i didn't even know which question to ask or, or i saw a lot of churches that were asking the wrong questions about you know how can we make the world a better place or how can we make this community a better place and the question i always came up with is well based on what or why or how is this part better than that part and why this community not that community and and all of that seemed to me like people were grasping at straws and just kind of guessing and saying i I think the church should do this well i think the church should do this well i think the church should do this and uh professor hauerwas's book just gave me an opportunity to finally ask better questions so uh, in asking those better questions i think that the the church that i serve has been blessed with far better answers now what will your fellow seminarians say when you post this interview that you just had with uh, Stanley Hauerwas. I will, I will surely get a lot of grief that I didn't ask enough good questions. But, well, um, you asked some great questions. Th- this guy is, is so highly regarded and, and revered, and he's an incredibly humble guy. You can tell that in his writing, so he's never going to receive the accolades we give him. Um, but, I mean, I, I used his books. Um, the first time I read Hauerwas, I think, was in seminary as a textbook. So it's it's not light reading. It's it's not. No, I can tell by talking to him. It's not light reading. <laughs> this guy, he's he's smarter than me and and everybody else I know. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, even was, even Mac though, Luke. I mean, I don't know. Mac is pretty sharp. He's a legend in his own mind. He is. He is. Hey, hey, I hear that. I get that. <laughs> Of all the voices you hear in your head, you heard that one too. Well, Luke, I really appreciate the co- listening in on the conversation that you and uh, Mr. Hauerwas had. But uh, you know, I I find myself probably like the average guy. I I uh, I dig this world. I dig the high end theology. It was my hobby for a while to to read things like this and and think these thoughts. But one of the things that challenges me as I listen to him talk and listen to you talk is. There is the 350,000, it's probably 50,000 foot view of what the church should be and ought to be, but actually getting those high-end ideas and making them fit in the real world presents a, an incredible challenge. And a, a good friend of mine, and I, we've had this conversation, and one of the things that he brings up is, if the church is in fact supposed to be not only a, a, an, an entity that proclaims the gospel, the truth of the gospel, uh, redemption and, and, and all that, the truth claims of Christ, etc., not only are we to to proclaim that, but if we are to be a colony, a community, a living, breathing world that people come into, the real, the number one challenge that we come up against is not just, quote, culture, although this is culture, it is the busyness of life. Right. People flat out don't want what we say is what they need. They don't want it. 
They're not in, they, they know they need it, but they've built their lives in such a way that there's no spot for it. Uh, here's a good example. Your church and the church that I attend are both very close to residents. I mean, actual homes. Right. I go to West Kirk Presbyterian. Outside of our parking lot is a whole slew of homes. I don't think any of those people go to West Kirk. Right. They drive past us Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday. Many of them might even go to a great Bible teaching evangelical church. Right. They might drive right past your church on the way to their church. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that doesn't seem like busyness, but that's a product of sort of that's what I mean by busy culture. We don't live in communities. We don't live in colonies. We don't interact with the people that, that are right next to each yeah, other. Yeah, it's because they call them cults. Seriously, Christianity was called a cult when it was started. I mean, Christians were murdered for a lot of those same reasons. Now, I can tell you. We followed that that crazy guy. I can tell you, Wes Kirk, at one time, most of those homes were owned by members of the church. When I went to Wes Kirk 20 some years ago, different pastor, different congregation, great people. But a many of those people that walked across the street to go to church bought that land from the the Colby's gave that land to West Kirk and to pay for the church, then they could sell off those lots. So at one time, there were many people living in those. Just point See, of but I think what we're falling into the trap of asking the wrong question. Why, why don't our neighbors come to our churches? You know, I, I have neighbors right next door. Troy's a great guy. And the question is, you know, he goes to the church. He, he, he goes west. I go east to church. You know, why don't we go to the same church? I'm, I'm a pastor. I, I can invite him anytime I want. Um, have you invited him? I have, yeah, okay. but he has a great church. I don't want to mess that up. I, okay. I think he goes to a great church. The, you never say that about me and my church. I don't. <laughs> but the, no, what I think we're, we're trying to do is, <laughs> is look to a different, different question, and that is, um, are we the residents or are we the aliens? Here's what I mean by that. When you, you talk about the busyness of our culture and how do we in, invade all of that, the problem is I think that... Um, the, we see ourselves as the native culture of America. Christians are the natives here. And what I think the book does nicely and what I think the church ought to do is start to see Christianity, not American, if we are in, in the, um, Europe or wherever, we are aliens to this world. And the natives are those who don't have faith in Christ. That's how we have to see ourselves. And so when you are a, mm. a, a foreign um, immigrant into a country, all right? So if, if I go to another country, I'm going to retain a fair amount of my own heritage, right? I'm not, I'm not going to abandon that and let it go, but I need to figure out how to interact with the locals. I need to figure out how to interact with the, the native culture of the, the place I'm at, right? So how much of that do I integrate into, into my culture before I ruin it? Well, we see, we see um, indigenous people and, and uh, those who have migrated in struggle with this all the time. That's where we have to start asking those questions and learn what is it that the, the church on earth needs to do to protect our culture, um, but how do we interact with the culture we're in? Now, we're in the culture of this America experiment. How much of that can creep into our church before we start losing it? All right, we're going to continue this conversation after we come back from our top of an hour break, and I think that's a, an appropriate segue Uh, into 1 Corinthians, which we were studying today, and a suicide that happened in our local community of a 16-year-old young man. We're coming back live here at The Truth. Thanks for listening.